Post-processing is a huge part of making a good looking game. To those who are unfamiliar with the term, post-processing basically means image effects that we can apply to change the look of our game. Usually you add post-processing as a nice last touch to your game, but sometimes it can even be used to create a completely different look. We've created a video on post-processing before, but since then it's been completely revamped and it's now easier than ever. So in this video, we'll have a look at how you can add post-processing to your game and we'll also go over each individual effect to give you a good idea of what you can do with it. But first, this video is sponsored by Ambience VR. Ambience VR are the creators of the amazing Unity plugin AT Explore. This plugin is designed to allow artists and architects to create interactive environments without worrying about coding. It provides you with a series of visual tools to manage cameras and interactions. With a few clicks, you're able to create interactive environments for Android, iOS, PC, Oculus Go and Quest, and OpenVR devices. The plugin also comes with prepackaged interactions like material switching, working doors, windows and drawers, and a visual scripting system. The team is made up of architects and computer engineers who are always ready to help. So if this sounds interesting to you, simply click the link in the description to get started. Now, before we get into it, we have to mention that post-processing is a little bit different depending on if you're using URP or HDRP. The workflow is pretty much the same, but HDRP does offer some more advanced effects. In this video, we'll focus on URP since that's the most commonly used and most of what you learn here should just apply to HDRP as well. And with that said, let's jump into it and play around with some colors. So as you can see, we are here in Unity 2019.3 and the demo scene we're using here is the RPG Polypack Lite, which is free on the Asset Store. We'll of course have a link for that in the description. Now to add post-processing, we first have to create a volume. To do this, we right click in the hierarchy, go under volume and select global volume. This object is responsible for adding post-processing to our camera. But first we have to create a profile. We do this by simply clicking new. As you can see, this creates a profile object that we can add effects to. In Unity, effects are called overrides. If we click add override, we get a list of effects to choose from. Let's just add a vignette. As you can see, all of the effect properties are blurred out. This is because we can choose what settings we want to influence. If for example, we want to adjust the intensity, we simply check the box next to intensity and adjust the slider to whatever we want. Now, at this point, you might be confused as to why nothing is happening. At least I was until I found this secret magic button hidden in the camera under rendering settings. Wow. You won't believe how long it took me to find this setting. Well, moving on. Another thing to enable is HDR, which you can find under your render pipeline settings. HDR stands for High Dynamic Range and is a way of packing more color data into your image. This gives us greater control over the look of the scene when we start applying image effects and helps us avoid clipping where you lose color information in very bright or dark spots. And that's it for setup. Of course, the new post-processing stack is using a volume system. This allows us to blend between different profiles on the fly, depending on the camera's position. This is great when you want different effects in different areas, such as when going underwater or inside a cave. Inside of Unity, we can choose between either global, where the camera is always affected, or local, which allows you to select a collider to use as the area for the volume. This means that the camera is only affected while inside the area. Now with that explanation out of the way, let's make things pretty. There are a lot of effects supported in URP, so we'll split them into a few categories to make things a bit easier to grasp. Color correction, lens stuff, camera, and effects. There are of course timestamps for all the effects in the description if you're looking for something in particular. Now let's start with color correction. The tone mapper maps colors from HDR color space to something the monitor can display. Here you have two options, neutral, which has minimal impact on the colors and is a great starting point if you want more control when color correcting, or ACES, which is an industry standard tone mapper for achieving a more cinematic look. I'll throw a link in the description if you want to know more about how ACES works. Just remember that you should always use some kind of tone mapper when you have HDR enabled. White balance allows you to adjust the color temperature to shift the colors toward blue, cold or yellow warm. You can use tint to do the same thing but between green and purple. Fun fact, it's actually called white balance because on real cameras you adjust this until the white parts of your image actually look white and not weirdly colored under different lighting conditions. Color adjustment is used to tweak the overall color, brightness and contrast of the image. This one is pretty self-explanatory. 
but I will give you a quick tip. I find that using the ACES tone mapper while also increasing the post exposure a bit often gives a really nice and bright appearance. The channel mixer allows you to tint the red, green and blue color channel. You can adjust the influence of red, green and blue for each channel. To be honest, I don't find this one very intuitive, so I don't use it a lot, but it's there if you need it. Now, Color Curves is a very versatile tool. The most common use case is to adjust the luminance of the image. If you've ever used the Curves adjustment in Photoshop, you already know what this does. The x-axis of the graph represents input luminance, and the y-axis represents output luminance. In other words, you can remap the luminance at different intensities. At the lower left side, the input luminance is zero, so completely dark. And top right is one, aka max brightness. If we lift the key up, the dark parts of the image will become brighter. With this, we can create curves that remap luminosity just the way we want. And this applies for each channel as well. If we want less red in the highlights, we can simply go to the red channel and turn it down. Now, that's the basic use case, but Unity has more tricks up its sleeves. You might have noticed that there are four additional curves to select in the dropdown. These let you control brightness and color in completely different ways. I won't go into detail with all of them, but I will show you a couple of cool use cases I stumbled across. For example, I think the sky in this scene could use a bit more color. So I'll select the hue versus saturation curve. Here we can adjust the saturation at a specific hue. In my case, that is light blue, so let's turn that up a bit. That's better. Now, I don't really like the color of the sky either. I would like it to be a bit more deep blue, so let's fix that as well. The hue versus hue curve works the same way, but instead of increasing saturation, we instead adjust the hue at a specific hue or color. So let's isolate blue again and adjust it. Perfect. Another cool effect you can make is a color splash effect. In other words, the image is completely grayscale except for one color. We can do this by going into the hue versus saturation curve and turning everything down. As you can see, the image is now grayscale. Now we isolate the color we want and turn that all the way up. So I'll select green to make the grass and trees stand out. You can even go ahead and hue shift it as well to get even crazier. As you can see, the sky's the limit with this one. Get it? Because we can adjust the color of the... Anyways. Shadows, midtones, and highlights allows you to separately control the tint and brightness of the shadows, midtones, and highlights of the image. You can also define the ranges of each. This is just a very intuitive tool for color grading. Lift, gamma, and gain works just like shadows, midtones, and highlights, but instead of letting you define the ranges, it instead uses the ASC CDL color grading standard. Whew, that's right, PhD in acronyms over here. I find that the color grading from this produces more natural results than shadows, midtones, and highlights. Now, that could really use an acronym. Split toning works by tinting the shadows and highlights to specific colors. This often produces a very stylized effect. However, a cool thing here is that you can adjust the balance between the two tints using a slider. What if I told you that everything we just went over can be accomplished with a single effect? That is the color lookup table, or LUT for short. Here Unity looks at every pixel and changes its color based on the supplied LUT file. So here's how to do it. Number one, take a screenshot of a scene from your game. Number two, import the screenshot into the photo editor of your choice. I'm using Photoshop. Here you do all the color adjustments that you need. Number three, apply the same adjustments to a neutral LUT and save it as a PNG. This is now your LUT file. And number four, assign the LUT file inside of Unity and voila, your scene now looks like the edited photo. Whew. All right, that's it for color settings. Now let's look at some effects. Bloom lets bright areas bleed into the surrounding pixels. Or in other words, it makes bright areas glow. The threshold determines how bright an area should be for Bloom to be applied. Without HDR, a threshold of one would mean that only completely white areas would have Bloom applied. But now that we are working with HDR, areas can have values greater than 1, which is very useful because it gives us full control over how much something should glow. We can control the overall intensity of the bloom using the intensity property and the spread of the glow by adjusting the scatter. The bloom effect also has a lens dirt option. This overlays a texture on the bloom, simulating stuff like smudges or scratches on the camera lens. We'll have a link to some free lens dirt textures in the description that you can use. 
Chromatic aberration splits the colors around edges of the game view into their red, green and blue channels. This is normally seen in low quality camera lenses, but is now often used to create a cool distorted look. Film grain overlays classic film noise onto the image for a cinematic feel. URP comes with a bunch of different grain types, but you can also supply your own. Vignette darkens the edges of the game view. This is also often seen in low quality camera lenses, but it is now being used for a dramatic effect a lot. Here you can control intensity, color, smoothness, and yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. Now on to some camera lens effects. Depth of field simulates focus. This means that everything that isn't at a certain distance from the camera gets blurred out. Here you can choose between Gaussian, which uses a common image blur technique to create a pretty cheap and quick depth of field effect, or Bokeh, which much more accurately simulates the way light behaves when entering a real-life camera lens. Here you can adjust real camera properties such as focal length and aperture to get the look you're going for. Motion blur simulates the blur that occurs when a real camera is moving while the shutter is open. This essentially stretches the light in the direction of the movement, which makes it feel more natural and smooth. Lens distortion distorts or curves the image. This allows you to create effects such as fisheye and what I've personally named the hyper speed effect. <laughs> Panini projection corrects perspective cameras with high FOV. This helps reduce stretching in the corners of the screen as well as keeps vertical lines straight. This one gets a bit wonky when used with moving cameras. Might be great for a drunk character though. Finally, we have a few more settings to look at. These however are located on the camera itself. Dithering applies noise to the image to prevent larger patterns when encountering quantization errors. Even though modern screens can produce some million colors, that's not always enough, especially in dark areas. So dithering helps eliminate some of the artifacts. Anti-aliasing helps to reduce jagged edges. It adds interpolation to smooth out stair stepped lines. At the moment, there are two options. FXAA and SMAA. FXAA is more performant while SMAA has better quality. Some of you might have noticed that there's also another setting with the name anti-aliasing. This one is located under the render pipeline settings. This is a third type of anti-aliasing called MSAA and it can be applied on top of the other anti-aliasing methods to really make sure that those lines stay smooth. And that's pretty much it for this video. If you liked it, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you don't miss the next one. And hopefully that gave you a good base to start using these effects in your game. We'll of course have some links in the description to where you can learn more. Also, don't forget to check out Ambience VR and their plugin AT Explore. Start creating interactive environments for your projects now by simply clicking the link in the description. On that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in May and a special thanks to Face of Marify, Lost to Violence, Love Forever, Replica Studios, Nobby Ninja, SRT Mike, Jason Uritescu, Liu Lisette, Piano Southern Luck, Donatine Gascoin, Dante Sam, Jacob Sanford, Naoki Wasaki, Marc Antoine Girard, Gregory Pierce, Michael Korobo, the Mighty Zeus, Owen Cooper, Elson the Fierce, Erasmus, and Sirius Wolf. You guys rock.